Good morning, everyone, or afternoon or evening, depending on where you are joining us from. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, I think this is going to be a fun conversation. This uh, The topic today is searching for stocks to ride the base metal bull market. I mean, it's a little forward looking to talk about a bull market right in this exact moment, but that's what investors need to do, right? Is look ahead instead of look at the exact moment. And so that's what we wanted to do today. <coughs> Excuse me. I have on the call with me uh, several gentlemen who have lots of insight into the base metals market. And one of the things that I think is nice about this group is that they cover multiple metals. So I'm going to ask each of them to speak to their metals so we can get some good insight into um, copper and zinc and, uh, you know, each metal on their own, maybe get some ideas. And then talk about uh, about how we think those markets might evolve over the next little while. So what I'll do to begin is just ask each um, president, CEO, chair, whatever your title might be, to introduce yourself and give just a quick, just a few minutes, who you are, what your company's um, doing so that we can set the stage. And then I have lots of questions ready to fire at you once we've gone through those introductions. Audience, please send your questions in as well. I will absolutely incorporate them into the conversation as we go along. And so in no particular order, John Black, would you like to um, to kick it, kick it off? Just let us know uh, who you are and uh, a little bit about Aldebaran Resources. Okay, great. Thanks, Gwen. It's a pleasure to be here with everyone. Hello to, to those of you that I know already. And Looking forward to this discussion. Um, I'm the CEO of Aldebaran Resources. At Aldebaran, what we um, specialize in doing is identifying large copper or copper gold deposits, um, capturing those at an early stage before they're fully revealed what's what's there, and then drilling those out, de-risking them, and then ideally selling them to a, a major mining company as our business strategy. Uh, with Aldebaran, we're, we're exploring the Altar project in San Juan province, kind of a hotbed for copper exploration right now. A really fun place to be, exciting place to be with a lot of a lot of activity in our project and others around. Aldebaran is actually the second of three companies we've had in the same management team. Our first company was, was Antares Minerals. We drilled out a deposit that we sold the first quantum in, in 2010. And we also have Regulus Resources, which is working on another copper gold deposit in northern Peru. So that's our niche. That's what we look at. And uh, we're pretty excited about the potential for copper in the not too distant future. Fantastic. Sticking on the copper theme, I'll ask George Ogilvy to step forward and tell us a little bit about Arizona Sonoran. Yeah. Hi, Gwen. And thanks uh, for the opportunity. So I'm George Ogilvy, uh, CEO of Arizona Sonoran Copper Company. Uh, we have the uh, the Cactus Project, which is obviously in Arizona in the U.S. of A. It's a former producing uh, mine that was owned by Asarco back in the 1970s and, and 80s. Um, the land package is all on private land. We already have some substantial permits in hand, namely a permit to take uh, water and the aquifer protection permit. And uh, the good news is that there's an abundance of water in a very strong aquifer um, about a thousand feet below the pot bottom of the current open pit. Uh, because it's a brownfield site, um, the permitting process should be relatively quick. And uh, given it's on private land, there's no federal nexus. We're only dealing with local state and uh, local municipal authorities. So there's a PEA out on the project with very robust economics. We're working on a rescope PFS. And we believe in the next two to three years, as we continue to de-risk the project, we can put this into commercial production as we start to see an uptick in the uh, in the copper markets. Fantastic. I think uh, I shouldn't be inserting my own comments yet, but try and stop me. I think the fact that George comments uh, quite a bit on permitting, even just in his introduction, is one of those things about base metals um, in general, right? It's hard to get projects actually built and it's been it's become a lot harder over the last 10 years. And that's a big structural part of the markets, the way that we're the way that the markets are right now. So I'm sure we will have further discussion on that. Uh, Terry Lynch, can you uh, give us a little bit of an introduction to Power Nickel? Yes, Gwen, and thanks for having us. And, uh, you know, hello to my fellow uh, commentators. Great to be here with you. So Power Nickel is developing the NISC uh, nickel sulfide project in uh, just south of James Bay, Quebec. It's uh, uh, an advancing project. We've got a historical uh, 3.1 million tons of about 1.6% nickel EQ or so, 
and uh, had some great initial results. And we're drilling right now, have been drilling since mid-September. We'll drill until mid-December and we'll post a new 43101 in, uh, in uh, Q1, we would think, into Q1. So uh, it, nickel is obviously a great spot to be right now, especially in the, if you're in the uh, higher grade uh, sulfide world. Uh, the nickel price curve looks fantastic. And two things drive nickel, urbanization and electrification. And both of those uh, are undeniable trends. So we're, we're pretty bullish about uh, nickel and about our prospects for having a, what we think will be Canada's next nickel sulfide mine. Fantastic. All right. Well, I will, I will in our next question ask each of you to dive into sort of your metal to give us more, uh, give us a little bit more depth on the kind of things that Terry just referenced there. But before we do that, Brandon McDonald, please give us a little bit of an introduction to Fireweed Metals. Uh, yeah. Hi, I'm uh, Brandon McDonald, CEO of Fireweed Metals. Um, we're a Canadian based uh, zinc slash tungsten developer tungsten i won't talk about today but um uh zinc of course the, at least alphabetically the last of the base metals <laughs> and uh you know our, our mcmillan pass project in yukon is a truly massive district i think it's very it's very easy to talk about district and explorers like to you know tout district scale land packages but there's at least four deposits on this uh there's a clear trend uh, where we see signs of at least a half dozen more <laughs> Um, so for us, we don't think that we're, we're stretching the definition to say that this is a true district. So the 2018 resource uh, that we put out included only a very small portion of this. So we've exploring really since then and, you know, west of there, uh, and identifying a, a really massive opportunity there. So, um, this is emerging as a project that is not like a, uh, uh, a good zinc project, but an absolute best in class. Um, so as the the market turns towards uh, base metals and, and value plays, we feel pretty pretty well situated. Fantastic. Um, I'm going to ask Carrie. I'm not sure we were having some sound struggles with Carrie in the pre in the lead up here. So, Carrie, is your sound working at this point? No. Okay. Well, then I won't ask him to do an introduction because that doesn't uh, that doesn't work. Uh, we will certainly get back to Harry. If I get the thumbs up that his sound is working, I will absolutely pull him into the conversation. But for now, let's move into some questions. So, like I said, I wanted to start the conversation um, with asking each of these CEO presidents um, to talk about their medal um, because you know we're in a bit of a, a crosswinds here where we have a recession, maybe not officially in the U.S., whatever you want to define it as. Um, but certainly elsewhere, we are facing recessionary contraction type conditions. We certainly have demand declines in China for systemic structural reasons, um, and, you know, with a range of opinions about how dire or not dire that will become. Um, but then, of course, we have on the flip side, you know, the, the needs of the green transition, which I think is an, an, uh, an undeniable force and something that I referenced before, which is a lack of new mines, right? We just don't have new mines for all kinds of reasons. So given those two opposing standpoints, let's talk about each of these metals. Brandon, I'm just going to go in reverse order here. I mean, one thing that I was reading just last week is, you know, zinc refined zinc inventories are down to like three days. Now, this is something that happens to some extent in the zinc market. That's a very near-term um, comment. But what's your outlook on zinc with that near-term? Maybe there's like supply risk shocks in the near-term um, and, and then looking ahead for zinc. Well, like the, the, the near-term's absolutely driven by the crisis in Europe, right, with energy. So um, if you have a, a zinc smelter in Europe that is not uh, by I think other than Belden in, in you know who has a, a hydro powered you know zinc lead smelter um, you're facing incredible energy prices right so most have been shuttered or or curtailed or, or something to that degree which is creating a huge shortage of, of physical metal there now now physical metal does not mean a shortage of concentrate out of out of mines right and so this is the the duality of any base metal market um, I think the tug of war between smelters and miners tends to be a little more pronounced in zinc uh, than other metals. But, you know, right now, if, if you have a smelter that has a good supply of cheap energy, which, you know, Belden does in Norway, Tech does it in, in British Columbia, et cetera, where you've, you know, you've got these hydropower, um, yeah, you're doing very well, right? So 
Um, minors, you know, I think uh, a little bit more difficult. Uh, treatment charge is definitely going to creep up and, and get into the ugly territory. But the the thesis for the medium to long term is is related to every base metal, which is that there's been a massive underinvestment, um, that there's no exploration getting done. The difference being um, that, you know, you, you think about global reserves to annual demand, you know, that ratio, uh, it's about half as much in, in zinc as it is, for example, in copper, right? Now, now part of that has to do with where the zinc is being mined and whether you're stating reserves, um, but it's still a, a you know, it, Zinc is, is much closer to a just-in-time reserves identification than, than a copper is. So both of these, not enough, right? Not enough investment. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's going to be interesting times ahead as you know, a few more mines fall off and it's, it's crisis territory because I don't see anything big coming down the line. Do you think, um, just following up on that near-term shortage, do you think zinc has the potential to do something crazy this, this winter? Um, because of the refined metal situation? Well, if you get a full stock out, which certainly looks like it's a possibility, then then anything's possible. I mean, we hit over $2 a pound uh, earlier this year, right? And I think easily that again, right? It, but, you know, it'll be like the recent, potentially like the recent spike in nickel or, or you know, past spikes in various metals where, you know, such a deep backwardation that the market is suggesting that it's not a intrinsic situation, but, but temporary, right? So, yeah. Gotcha. All right. Um, moving along, Carrie. I think we have you joining the conversation. I'm, I'm here. Can you can you hear me now? We certainly can. That's fantastic. So Great. I'll hit you with a double question, which is: uh, Explain yourself. Who are you, and who is Generation? Um, in very short, and then we had moved on into um, explaining your perspective on the sort of supply demand fundamentals for your main metal and, and for, for PGEs, I mean, they're uh, for platinum group elements, they're a little bit complicated for people to wrap their heads around sometimes. So do you want to just give us the primer on your outlook for those metals after you let us know a little bit about why, uh, why you're talking about them, what generation is doing? Sure. Thanks, Gwen. Um, I'm uh, Kerry Noel, the chairman of uh, generation mining. We uh, have been around for four years. We are developing the, uh, Palladium Copper Project in Northwestern Ontario. It's um, just about at the final permitting uh, stage. Uh, we did a feasibility study last year. We're close to having it financed. It's going to produce about 245,000 ounces of palladium equivalent a year. And um, we are just uh, hoping to start construction uh, early next year, so depending on a few factors such as financing. But uh, so uh, as far as the fundamentals go, uh, palladium, of course, is a critical metal. It's um, un un unlike a lot of these other metals that are the metals of the future. Uh, this is the metal of now because it's um, it's required to be in virtually every gasoline-powered car in the world that is sold. So uh, as a result, the uh, and, and there's only two sources for 80% of the, the world's supply, and that's Russia and South Africa. Um, the Russian material was never really sanctioned because sanctioning of that would have cut off uh, probably 30% of the automobile assembly lines in the world. Um, so the uh, governments, um, they, they, they've tried to punish Russia a little bit on it, but not really. Uh, so the material is all getting to market. Um, there's a very, very low inventories of this. Uh, the reason that the price has backed off from its highs of over $3,000 was partly because the um, uh, of the recession in the automobile industry, the lack of chips, that is now seeming to be resolved. And as it, as a result, we're expecting palladium uh, demand to increase significantly through the winter and into 2023. So um, we think that the timing is good for us to get going on the mine. Fantastic. Okay. Um, there's lots more to talk about for, for all of these things, but let's carry on. I'll leave the two copper guys to battle it out at the end, but, uh, before that, I'll take it over to Terry, um, to talk about nickel. And I mean, nickel is, there's again, a lot of complications or a lot of questions around nickel, a lot of, uh, changing technologies, suggestions of changing technologies. Uh, give us a, give us your perspective on the nickel market and the, and the opportunity yeah. there for investors. Yeah, I mean, it's got to be one of the the best looking uh, base metals. I think uh, structurally, it's in a you know 
either a small surplus or a small deficit this year, probably fairly similar next year. And then it looks like it, it's going to just become a, a serious structural deficit problem. Again, it's not easy to find it, and there's not a lot of new stuff coming on. Um, and it takes, even in the, the most optimistic scenario, you know, I think Talon Metals is talking about, you know, uh, getting up and running from basically a PEA to a mine in, in six years, which would take a miracle in my view. But but God bless. Let's hope that happens with, uh, you know, permitting being uh, managed and encouraged and, and some hoops uh, that are removed, you know, from the development process, which is the talk, you know, right now uh, in, in the developed world. Um, but, yeah, no, it, it's, uh, you know, you got two major driving forces, urbanization, which is stainless steel. Stainless steel is 60% of the, of the nickel market. So as, as people get more urbanized and move to, you know, cities and, and uh, out of rural situations, they're buying pots and pans, fridges and stoves, and that's uh, that's stainless steel. And then electrification, which right now is about uh, um, 15% or so of the uh, nickel demand. Uh, is expected to be 50% within a few years. So, you know, it's just very difficult to bring that uh, level of nickel online in the, in the short order of time. So it's going to have a, uh, you know, a material impact on the price curve. But all of these base metals on the battery side, they're sort of a puzzle, right? You know, so if nickel price gets at a whack, they'll stop using nickel, you know, they'll, or they'll minimize it, you know, so, and, and, and you know, but if all go up at the same time, you know, if cobalt goes up and lithium goes up and manganese goes up and nickel goes up radically, I don't know what these nickel, uh, these battery guys will do, you know, but at some point the economics get uh, a bit wacko. So, uh, you know, there's an overdrop of a, of, of a broader economic uh, theory there to be discussed, but generally the outlook is uh, about as bullish as you could get. Absolutely. I mean, I think one of the things that I often comment when people ask me about nickel is that it's hard to wrap your head around the scale of growth of a nickel market. And that's true for something like lithium, where 20 years ago, we barely used it for anything. We used it for like making ceramics or something. And now we need it for like every battery and every electric vehicle. And so that market is exploding. Well, nickel has always been a reasonably like a significant market, but its growth from here based on electrification is just this like fairly crazy phenomenon. And like you say, trying to supply any metal growth profile like that is uh is 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 a crazy proposition especially in our current try to get a mind built um environment george why don't i give you the chance to start on copper and i'm sure john will have things to add but what do you what do you have to say right. about the copper market well look i mean uh, i think in the short term we're gonna see uh supply outstripping the demand as we all know you know copper is a, a bellwether for the general economy and uh, you could argue we're already in a recession, but it certainly feels as if if we're not heading into a recession, there's going to be a economic downturn throughout the entire world. And obviously, China is a very big player when it comes to the copper market. And as we know, things are slowing down there. Now, the kind of dichotomy is, is that although supply will outstrip demand, it doesn't necessarily mean that the copper price is going lower as Brandon's already pointed out with the energy crisis in Europe and a lot of smelters and refineries being closed or scaled back, we're seeing throughout the world uh, bonded warehouses of copper, you know, with extremely low inventories, as you've already pointed out, only down to one or two days of copper supply for the world. So I think the, the copper price is probably going to be supported by those low inventories throughout 2023 and we'll see the copper price itself sort of range bound between this $3.25 and $3.50 that it's been trading at over the course of the last six months or so. I think longer term, however, there will be structural deficits with copper as we've spoken about, you know, the electrification, the decarbonization thesis that's taking place throughout the world. I believe they're anticipating that, you know, annual refined copper is going to have to go from its current 25 million tonnes to something like 50 million tonnes in the next two decades. And by the end of the century, it's going to have to be north of 35 million metric tonnes. So those are huge increases. And the only way to incentivize those increases is through price. Mm -hmm. And that'll bring new production online which is going to be stymied because of the environmental and permitting challenges. And it's going to keep some of the current mines in production and some of those marginal producers in production over the next uh, decade. So 
I'm extremely um, op uh, optimistic and uh, very bullish on um, you know the green energy commodities and in particular copper, medium and longer term. Absolutely. I mean, I, I reference nickel as a market where it's hard to wrap your head around the scale of growth because of the green transition. Copper, I could have said the same thing about copper, right? This has been the PhD of metals for such a long time. And yet the growth profile that is projected based on this green transition is, again, hard to wrap your head around. Mm -hmm. John, uh, I mean, what, what do you have to add about uh, about copper, about your outlook for copper you're still muted right now, so just click on your. Yeah, I think George just covered it pretty well that we really have this somewhat of a disconnect. And, and we see this when we present at investor conferences and other places where there's general consensus that the demand for copper will, will skyrocket at some point in time. But it, at the current moment, it's not there. And it's, and it's obviously due to economic uncertainties at the moment. We have had. Uh, a little bit more supply come into the market with Kamoa, QB2, Kayoveco coming on. And that kind of coincided with when we, we have this economic uncertainty. However, we still see low inventories. So we, we've really kind of absorbed that right now. So I absolutely agree with George. I don't think we, we have a lot more to drop on this. It's really a question of, of when do we get through these these times now and, and kick in. And the, the green revolution has really started now. There's there's really not much of a way to stop that. Yeah. And we've talked about all the metals that are associated with it. It really comes back in many ways to copper because copper is what transmits that electricity around and it's fundamental. It doesn't matter to us in the copper space whether it's a lithium battery or a nickel dominant battery or, or hydrogen, you still need to move that electricity and you still need to generate electricity in some ways. And they're just, the predictions are through the roof. I think I'll, I'll rob from uh, what Robert Friedland told us all at Beaver Creek a little bit ago. He pointed out that the amount of copper that we will use in the next 22 years is the same that's been used in history up to this point in time. So can you imagine thinking about how do we, we develop as many mines as we've seen developed in the past in in the next 20 to 30 years. It's it's mind boggling, really. So it uh, there's there's there'll undoubtedly be a, a boom, and it's it's a great time to have your hands on a good copper asset right now. So a bunch of you have referenced um, political. Uh, it, ramifications in your markets. And I think obviously well, there's a there are massive geopolitical shifts underway in the world right now that are, to be blunt, impacting how metals can move around, right? If this, since, that, since that's the topic of our conversation, they obviously, these geopolitical shifts have much more far-reaching implications as well, but we're talking about metals today. So can we talk about each of these markets and some of those geopolitical shifts? I mean, obviously, there's the Russia-Ukraine war, which impacts several of the metals that are in conversation today. But there's also, you know, changes in leadership in, in countries in South America. There's lots of things that are happening. So is there anything uh, anything geopolitical that you think is uh, important to the market for your main metal um, that you think deserves some attention? John, I'll just I'll just head back to you. We'll go in in reverse order. Okay, I'll just touch on a couple of things. I'm sure George will, will kick in on some of the other ones as well. Um, in the copper space, I don't sense that the war in Ukraine is as directly impacting us as much as some other metals. Uh, the region of the world doesn't produce that much copper, so it's it's really not there. What it really affects us is on energy costs and inflation and other, other issues that are perhaps uh, exacerbated by that situation. So, um, but you touched on on China. That's really one that, that a lot of people are talking about right now. And and certainly the the strong measures they took to control um, COVID situation and things like that resulted in in strongly decreasing certain elements that are, of their economy. But there, as I was just talking to people that are at the LME conference this morning, and they were pointing out that. Uh, there's a general perception that China is quite a bit ahead of other countries in terms of positioning themselves to enter into a lower carbon economy. Mm. And, uh, and that's interesting that they're doing that. They're, they're positioned to EV sales are still strong. Housing's down like it is in many parts of the world. But I, I really view China right now as more like it's a downturn in their market. And, and that means the upside potential is tremendous there. Uh, sure, like any other economy, there may be a little bit more downside to it. But right now, but but think about the rebound that can come out of that. And then I'd just also like to point out that we focus a lot on China. 
but um, people shouldn't forget about India coming up behind this. Uh, there's, there's a large population that hasn't even begun to go through some of the increased metal use that we see in China right now. And it's, it's poised to, to really kick in here pretty strongly as well. Yeah, very good points. Uh, George, what might you add? I mean, I think partly permitting in the in the U.S. Is, is obviously near and dear to your heart. I always, I often end up in this conversation where people are asking, well, are governments at some point just going to have to be more positive and supportive in their approach to mining? Like, are we going to come up against a point where there's no there's no choice but that? And we're we're kind of seeing that to some extent, yeah. maybe the early stages of it in some other metals like uranium in the U.S. So, yeah. Yeah, well, I'll touch on the permitting right now, but I wanted to piggyback on what John mentioned there. I mean, obviously, we're talking about copper and we have to mention China. And, you know, China imports a lot of its copper through scrap and through concentrates because it has smelting capacity and refining capacity. But, you know, I think in Europe and maybe at a later stage, North America, as we begin to realise that a lot of this copper and other, you know, electrical vehicle, green energy style commodities, the raw materials are absolutely critical. I think those countries are going to take more of a nationalistic approach and you may actually see less concentrate and actually less scrap heading over to, to, uh, to, to China. And it may actually remain in Europe and in North America just because of its criticality. So I think, you know, that uh, those fundamentals in the world politics, I think, um, you know, the political position and who's vying for, you know, superpower status is going to play, you know, massively in where the copper gets distributed in future years. And and uh, obviously the, the US of A, you know, permitting is obviously absolutely critical. Again, we've got this dichotomy right now where the Biden administration is, you know, throwing billions of dollars into critical elements and, you know, giving out loans uh, for, for companies, which is great, but nothing's really happening with respect to the permitting process, which we know if you can get through the permitting from an expiration story all the way to commercial production, at a minimum, it's taking 10, if not 15 years now from discovery to actually getting a mine into production. And, you know, this structural deficit, you know, that we've been speaking about today is, you know, if it doesn't improve um, and the, the, with the demand that's coming over the next several decades for these style of uh, commodities, it's going to create huge increases in, 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 in price, as I said earlier, to keep the existing mines in production and bring some of the near term producers or the marginal mines, you know, into production to meet that uh, that demand. So fortunately, you know, Arizona Sonora and Copper Company, we uh, we're in a situation where we're all on private land. There's no federal nexus. We are only dealing with the state regulators and the local municipality. And uh, we see a clear pathway to uh, to commercial production with the remaining permits that are outstanding. So that's good news for our shareholders on a go forward basis. Sounds good. OK, let's move into some of these other metals that are. Uh, that have different political geopolitical considerations at play. Carrie, let's let's talk about. I mean, platinum, Russia. There's no connection there, right? <laughs> well, the palladium uh, metal uh, has always been, and, and platinum as well, has always been very political. Uh, historically, it was there were basically two sources for them, and, and that's all there really is now for 80 percent of the metal. So, uh, other than uh, recycling, is really picked up, but. Uh, on the political side, one of the on the on the both the supply and demand side, there's an interesting um, events happening right now, and that's really around the electric car partly, um, because uh, if if uh, there was 100 percent electric cars out there and and, and no gasoline anymore, uh, we would be in a situation where there would be very low demand for palladium, and it would be probably one or two hundred dollars an ounce. However. That electric car market, uh, for reasons of shortage of lithium, shortage of charging stations, shortages of copper, nickel, probably, um, you, you, it, it's going to it's going to pan out over decades, not over a few years. There's just not it, it's just not able to do it uh, as fast as people think. In the meantime, so and governments are starting to mandate it. They're talking about 2035 uh, for for uh, you know no more sale of gasoline cars. However. They are including hybrids in the uh, in, in the electric car in those in those estimates. So 
uh, hybrids bring us around to another interesting fact is that uh, hybrid cars use more palladium than a regular car because they don't burn as hot. Uh, and, and as a result, and, and hybrid cars are far outselling electric vehicles right now. And, and that's projected to be uh, the case for the next 10, at least the next 10 years. So um, you've got one situation happening with the politicians uh, starting to mandate electric cars at some vague future date. But then you've got the other situation of, uh, of, of, of hybrids. And then the third thing that's happening is that Europe, China and India are still increasing the palladium loadings per automobile in an attempt to clean up the air. The, for example, in, in Europe right now, the, um, the bad gases that cars produce uh, are, are 98% eliminated uh, through catalytic converters. Uh, that is actually mandated to go to 99%. So they're going to take out half of what's still coming out uh, in, in, by 2027. That means more palladium in every car. Same thing is happening. India is really just getting going on this. And there's Nigeria, <clears throat> Indonesia, Brazil, Mexico. They're all trying to clean up those big polluted cities. And uh, catalytic converters is, is, is one of the ways they're doing that. So you've got increases happening. That's government uh, mandated. Um, you've got, um, and then eventually you're going to have uh, electric cars, uh, also government mandated. But uh, that's a long, long way out. Seventy seventy-seven percent of the world's uh, energy uh, or electricity is uh, is, is uh, generated using carbon. So in, until you change that, there's no point for an electric car. <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, I mean, I open up a can of worms here. I mean, when I say geopolitics, yes. And I, I love this. This conversation can cover the whole range, right? From from the basics of supply all the way through to the details of demand. So that's that's cool. It's a good conversation to have for sure. Terry, uh, Nichols, another one. Lots of geopolitical shifting factors at play. What would you, uh, how would you bring nickel into this conversation? Yeah, I mean, obviously, right now with the uh, Russian situation, Norilsk being a, a massive, uh, you know, twenty percent producer uh, on the class one nickel, um, which is what's needed for the batteries, they're you know a bit destabilized right now. But I, I think that nickel honestly finds its way in the market that finds its way through to China and India, who are either if they're not uh, willfully ignoring it, they're they're somehow uh, it's passing through. So I think that sort of you know there's some structural friction there. Uh, which isn't efficient, but uh, I think that still flows. I think the, some of the bigger issues in nickel is the ESG stuff. You know, like for example, some of the bigger potential future projects in nickel are are these laterites in the tropical areas of the world that are, uh, um, you know, hugely carbon negative to develop. You know, so in theory, we're developing you know nickel as an electrification solution for a cleaner, you know, more carbon friendly world. Uh, but by you know destroying the rainforest and, and being a, a, anyway look at it a super heavy negative carbon impact, so I don't know how the math works in that. But uh, um, you know it makes me uh, you know ang- you know very positive towards clean nickel sources. So if you've got a you know a um, you know a uh, high grade nickel sulfide that's uh, um, you know easy to develop, relatively speaking. I think you're going to be obviously favorably positioned, and uh, um, you know I think the you know the uh, politicians uh, they don't want to be tainted with uh, hey I'm supporting uh, destroying greenfield uh, you know or you know uh, the jungle in uh, Indonesia or the Philippines or whatever thing like that. So very much these days, I think uh, you'll be looking at uh, people wanting to have a uh, you know where did where did my nickels come from that's in your car, and if it's if it's if it's a uh, um, not from a politically acceptable solution, you know, environmentally speaking, that could drive demand and and uh, and supply. So um, that's some of the stuff we're seeing. Absolutely, like I say, wide ranging conversation. Brandon, uh, what uh, what where does zinc fit into any of these geopolitical forces? Yeah, well, you know, I guess um, the you know the zinc market not not uh, overly Quite reliant right. on on Russia, except for the Russian gas and in, in Europe. Right. And, um, you know, I think it's, it's a universal thing amongst whatever your base metal that, that we've had three factors converge here that are going to shake up the industry. First is that, you know, I, I shift to lower carbon. And if you do two car, true carbon accounting, you start to question whether you mine and why you mine in Peru, smelt in China, send the agates to Europe for, or, you know, or to, to America for galvanization of a car that gets sold in Europe, right? So 
um, you can uh, you start to question globalization. Then then you you also look at COVID, which which you know annihilated supply chains, and then you get the Ukraine crisis, which which then that much more questions. Okay, well, where is everything coming from? So as you start to onshore these supply chains, as you start to deglobalize, um, it's going to mean every inventory has to be just that much more, right? Because you can no longer talk about global zinc inventories or global copper inventories or global nickel inventories because certain inventories are going to be unavailable to, to different groups, right? So it means the necessary restocking is going to be that much more than it would have been in a true globalization, right? So, um, you know, that, that resource nationalism, if it comes with an absolute, you know, an actual willingness to permit things in the West, which is, you know, a, a question mark, um, you know, is, is a lot to think about. And, and, and we have to sort of think about, okay, so where, where is our zinc coming from? 30% of it now comes from China, yet they're still in that importer. Um, they're voraciously buying projects all around the world. Um, do we want them to buy it all? Do they? Do we want them to own that value chain? Um, I, I think it's it's a it's a universal depending you know or despite you know or it's a universal regardless of the base map, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so I think that's that's the big question mark is the strict global supply demand balances do not necessarily reflect the actual unique localized supply demand balances that are that are going to be important in a deglobalized future. You know, the extent of the deglobalization we don't know, but there's certainly some of it coming. Absolutely. Talk about talk about the tip of the iceberg, but absolutely that that is sort of the question, isn't it? Okay, let's move on to stocks. Um having set the stage a bit here with metals, let's move on to to stocks and and if investors who are listening do see opportunity in these arenas, um, I, what I wanted to ask was, I mean, right now valuations in the mining sector are, are um, low, shall we say? Um, and uh, so if an investor is looking to enter, whether now or sometime in the next while when they believe that things have more bottomed, um, you guys are all exploration or mining company leaders, and you're also investors in this sector, at least I would assume so. Um, so what characteristics do you think will make some base metal stocks perform better than others if when, I, I think I should say when, um, sentiment does swing back towards growth and therefore investors do get interested in investing in things like metals again? What do you think positions a stock to, to outperform in that moment? Brandon, let's uh, let's go to you to start. I look, I've, I've said it before, but but the companies with the best projects move first when the market turns, and they move the furthest, right? So um, I'm not a big fan of the uh, trading mentality of I'm going to pick the the company that's the most marginal producer because that gives me the most torque <laughs> to, to the commodity price. That is extremely dangerous. Um, you know, because there's there's bills to pay, right? So that's that's a very easy strategy to go to zero. Um, so I would, you know, I, I think you start with with the highest quality projects that look like that are already Q1 or you know first or second quartile producers or have the potential to be first or second quartile producers. So these are not marginal projects. These are not going to be the swing projects and ones that are are you know in the top ten percent in terms of size potentially uh, either there or it's when that. If, if you've if you've got those two, um, you know that's that's absolutely best in class, right? And and the other thing it, to look for is, um, you know, companies that have done a lot of work and maybe have less left to do, right? Like you know that's, you know, inflation favors the incumbent, right? So so those of us who have advanced stage projects that have a lot of money sunk into them, right? There there's there's a real value underpinning. Uh, the the undervaluation right of our of our stock whereas an exploration play perhaps with just a couple holes in it yeah it can look very sexy but they've got a lot of spend ahead of them to delineate it and a lot of risk with that right so you know my personal preference is look for best in class uh advanced stage projects um and and you know buy and hold for longer term 
Gotcha. Terry, in the nickel world, I mean, I would say not that many years ago, there were very few listed nickel companies out there for investors to, who were interested in playing the spectrum from like exploration through to production, right? It, was a, it wasn't a great and easy market to get exposure to. Now there's, a, there's been a pro proliferation of nickel entities out there. Uh, how would you suggest investors sift through those options? Yeah, I think, you know, the song curve is a, is a great uh, guide for uh, mining investors generally. And there's a couple times, uh, you know, as an investor, you want to be uh, on the on the left hand side of the curve when it's just starting. And that can happen on expiration. It can actually happen in development. So depending on where you're at, you know, that I think that's the first thing is find out where you're at on the song curve and the project you're investing on. And, and then the, the next question is, does the company have enough capital to move to the next stage? Uh, you know, in the, in the development and, and because obviously these are difficult capital markets and the dilutive, uh, you know, uh, you know, to the companies right now. So you want to have that money in hand so that you can actually create additional value because here we are, all of us, I'm sure are massively undervalued. I, I, I know that, but, you know, from a consumer or investor perspective, it's like, what have you done for me lately? So what is the new news that's going to make me wake up to your great value proposition. So you, you need to have some catalysts that are funded and they're happening imminently that will get the new news out that actually people can look and sort of reflect them on the song curve and say, hey, do these guys offer me, you know, unique and, you know, uh, sustainable value at this point? If they do, then I should be a buyer. And I think, you know, one of the big things I, I found is that, you know, speaking to Brandon's point, absolutely people should be looking at, you know, um, you know, what's this going to be in the long term? Buy and hold. Like, not this is not a trade. You know, you know, will power nickel be, you know, 10 times its price, in, you know, in, in 60 days? Who knows? But in, in give me give me a year. Yeah, and I would say highly likely there's a great chance that that will happen. You know, on two years, even better. So it's like if you had to wait two years to make 10 times your money, is that a bad thing? You know, so I think almost everyone on this call would be in that type, type of circumstances. And there's, you know, where can you get that? You know, in a world that's shaky, you're buying assets, as, as Brendan said, where we've put a ton of money in the ground already. You know, there's a lot of inherent value built up, but it's, it needs some catalyst. So, you know, that's those are my thoughts. I think it's you know, look for the, the companies that are funded for, you know, to, for the next catalyst and then make sure you're at the right point in the curve. Gotcha. That, yeah, those are good points for sure. Carrie, what would you, what do you look for when you're surveying sort of the base metal or, or battery metal landscape? What do you look for in companies? What do you like? Um, a lot of it's already been said. Um, certainly the spot on the Lausanne curve is, 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 is important, but to, to that I would add, um, how are their financing prospects? How are their uh, permitting prospects? How are their First Nations? If you're in Canada, your First Nations uh, negotiations going um, but I would the first and foremost thing is I would look at management and say, have they have they achieved what they set out to say two, three, four years ago? Even though we're in a downturn right now in terms of share prices, this is the real time where management should be getting their ducks in order and getting it ready, getting their projects ready to go. Um, and and if the if the people have been doing that and and um, you know, there's mines out there that have taken eight years to get permitted. Um, there's other ones that have been permitted in two years. And, and uh, you know, how is management handling that? That That's management after the metal and, and the, the actual reserves in a project. Management is, is, is by far the next most important thing. So have a look at the management. See if they've done this before. See if they know what they're doing. And see if they've, uh, <clears throat> they've achieved the goals that they set out a few years ago. Uh, on, on, you know, close to the schedule. Nobody makes it all on, on schedule, but make, make it at least close. I think you're, uh, you, you, you speak to my heart when you say that, because one of the ways that I often summarize my criteria for stocks is, does management have a credible plan to create new value for shareholders? There's no guarantees in this business. There's no guarantees in most businesses. But is there a credible, detailed plan for how to turn, how to try to create new value? Um, and then do, do they do what they can to achieve that? Is, is our real efforts made to progress down that path markets notwithstanding um george and, and john are at different stages in that progressing down the value creation chain for sure um given the the stages of their projects george what do you what do you have to say about i mean a lot's been said if it's a short answer <laughs> correct, 
when you're looking across the base metal landscape, what might you be interested in buying at this point in the market looking ahead? Yeah, well, certainly, um, you know, the panel's brought up lots of uh, good points, which I'll agree with. Um, I think the ESG angle, obviously, you know, given we're looking at commodities in the green energy sector, I think is going to be more and more critical for investors and actual funding as we go forward. Mm -hmm. As some of the panelists already brought out, I mean, uh, you know, if we're producing these metals to go into electrical vehicles, but we're putting up more carbon dioxide and greenhouse gas emissions into the atmosphere, then ultimately what that metal is going to save when it goes into an electrical vehicle, we're kind of defeating the purpose. So, you know, I think as the world uh, and the green energy you know, sector evolves, I can see more and more premiums being given to companies who have very strong ESG strategies and are actually able to execute on them and can actually deliver, you know, a pound of copper for net zero carbon emissions. And those companies will differentiate themselves from the rest of the pack and they'll be given premium valuations. Yeah. I mean, I'm I'm currently in the process of launching a new newsletter that's going to be called Evergreen Investing. And I, one of the reasons is because I do agree with you that there's huge flows of capital coming into that space. It's inevitable. Um, and the term ESG has become a bit too diffuse. And so um, though I think there will be some more tactical focus with that money on, you would hope at least, on projects and opportunities, inputs, innovations to the green transition that um, benefit broadly that effort um, in, in, you know, in yeah. sidestepping some of the, the potholes that you guys have identified already here. John, what do you have to add? I promise I'll let you answer first on the next question so that everyone won't have said everything already. Turn your uh, mic back on. John, your mic's, you're muted. Everyone's very careful to make sure we don't get their background noise and then they don't turn their mic back on. Yeah, I, I think uh, I think the panel's uh, really captured most of the key points. You really focus on the quality of the project, the team. Have they done it before? Where, where are you located at? Can you work there or not? What's your access to capital? Um, so I, I don't think I can can really add too much more that hasn't already been been said on that. But what I would like to point out to, to investors that are looking in this space right now is, is that when, when we're in a situation like this, and I benefit from a, more decades than I care to admit of being in the business here, but when we're on a bottom like this, it's a natural tendency to be hesitant and to wait to see it take off. And, and it, we have a general consensus that, uh, say, in the copper space that George and I work in, that the fundamentals are fantastic for things to take off in the, sometime in the future. And everybody wants to have that comfort that they're not going early, that, you know, what, what happens if there's another bottom? I can give an example of, of what happened to us in our previous company in the financial crisis in 2008, 2009. As we came into that in 2008, we just delivered a lot of great drill results on a project. We, we had Antares at over $5 a share. Everything was flying high. A lot of companies talking to us about buying. And the global financial crisis hit. And we went from over $5 a share to $0.38 cents a share in a matter of a few months. And it was like catching falling knives. And everybody was panicked. And, uh, and everybody was concerned about it, but that nothing changed on the project or the location or the fundamentals for copper. And within 18 months, that company was sold for more than $9. And it's, so markets can turn very quickly and you can miss that by, by trying to time the bottom, you can miss it. So it's wise if you agree on the fundamentals in a space to begin to quietly do your research, put some bets down, and, and get positions on this. Because what you don't want to do is look back and say, boy, I knew that was the case and it's already jumped 30% on me. And then you get hesitant, you don't go in again and you and you miss an opportunity. So so pay attention to that. The other fundamental thing that when in that situation that happened to us is we made a decision, even though it was really scary times, to continue to drill during that downturn and produce results. And so as we quickly came out of that downturn, we delivered a positive PEA. And that's critical. You want to be careful of companies that freeze up right now and don't do work because this, this as someone mentioned in the panel just a few minutes ago, it's it's the time for us to be doing good quality work and really having things set up to go forward. So so uh, don't don't try to overthink it too much. If you if you agree on the fundamentals of it, it's a great time to put that down. I think that was a great summary of the of the situation and what you just said about uh, about companies needing 
to carry on and be able to continue working in, in down markets just gets to the heart of that whole balance between raising money and spending money when, when capital markets are tight. But that also gets to the comment about management and whether, to be blunt, you have access to capital. Have you cultivated those relationships? Do you know how to get it done? Um, and that's a big differentiator, I think, among stocks, too. There are certainly companies out there that would probably like to be working right now, but just straight out can't access capital. And so they're stuck in the water. So those are different. Uh, those are differentiators, in my opinion, as well. Okay, we only have uh, 10 minutes left. Um, and so just because we haven't given you guys much time to talk about your own assets, your own um, stocks, we did a little introduction at the beginning. Um, and it's been brought up a bit, but I wanted to get let each of you uh, finish up by saying by asking, is there one point or message like the elevator pitch moment um, that you would want a potential investor to remember about your stock? In the context of this interesting conversation that we've just had, like, what's the thing that you would want them to remember about about Aldebaran? John, we'll uh, we'll we'll go to you to begin. Well, the key thing with Aldebaran is we're we're early in the stage. We're still defining an extremely large resource. We have a great resource in hand already, um, but it's not fully revealed on the full size. We're working in a province in San Juan in Argentina that's remarkably pro mining at the moment. Uh, we're actually being pushed to move the project faster. Than we can, which is very unusual in this situation. Mm -hmm. And we have a lot of peers around us that are um, developing very interesting projects as well. And we we have the Argentine government recognizing the importance of developing a mining industry and specifically a copper mining industry and the benefits it can have. So um, it's a project that we believe is strongly undervalued right now. And it's a, but one that has all of the hallmarks of, of being the type of copper asset that will be of interest to a major company. So it's a, it's a great time to take a look at us right now, not just simply in terms of project and management and location, but what the valuation of that is. Uh, there are other projects that are maybe a little more visible that people have already jumped on and the valuations are high. So there is more leverage to our story right now. Fair enough. All right. George, what's the what's the one take home message that you would want to uh, to send investors away with on Arizona Sonoran? Well, um, we currently have a compliant resource today of six and a half billion pounds of copper in the ground in Arizona. And we know that Arizona supplies the domestic U.S. with over 70 percent of its domestic uh, copper supply. And uh, we believe that that demand for copper is only going to exponentially increase. And I would say over the next two to three years, Arizona Sonoran uh, can place itself so that we can meet some of that demand, which is coming based on, uh, you know, the drive for decarbonization and, and green energy. And the good news is, is we're in a district that's very well known for copper. Immediately south of us, we have Robert Friedland and the Ivanhoe Electric Group who border our southern boundary. They're reporting 10 billion pounds of copper currently in the ground. We think that's going to incrementally grow. So when you look at our region, uh, we're probably looking at plus 20 billion pounds of copper all on private land with access to, uh, to water and water permits in hand. So we can put this mine into production in the next several years and meet that uh, demand, which is ultimately coming. Absolutely. I, I certainly, for Arizona Sonoran, for me, it's a, it's a new company that is surprisingly advanced in its asset and its its speed towards development. Um, I don't remember what order I did everything in, so sorry if this isn't perfectly backwards, but uh, Carrie, what's the, uh, what's the one, what's the key message that you would want people to remember about generation? Well, you know, we've only been in existence for four years, our company, and we're um, in the final throes of permitting and financing a mine. So I think that the, uh, one thing to remember is how fast we've done what we've accomplished in, in this company. And the second one, um, I know you asked for one, but the second one is that uh, if if I'm wrong on the Palladium and, and the electric cars, et cetera, we have uh, about 30% of our, our revenue is going to be coming from copper. So we have a built-in hedge in our reserves for both metals. So if, if palladium demand goes down, that'll be because electric cars are popular, and that means copper is going to go up. So that's just a, 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 it's a bit of a whimsy, but it's also um, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's an unusual situation to have a hedge like that. Absolutely. Another, another fast-moving asset for sure over the last few years. Terry, a take-home message about Power Nickel. 
I guess fundamentally, I think the first thing I'd say to investors is that we're probably the lowest uh, market cap uh, nickel exploration company per pound of nickel uh, discovered in the ground. Yeah, so that's an important start point. And we're, we're drilling now, have been drilling for about a month, got another two months of drilling. So in terms of near-term catalysts, uh, be a lot of exciting exploration results coming out over the next three months and uh, an update of 43101. So I think there's a an exciting entry point there on that little song curve. So that's what I'd tell people to focus on. Gotcha. Brandon, you didn't even pay me for it, but you got the last word. <laughs> <Take Yeah. on. laughs> thank you. Thank you. Um, you know, I, I, when you think about fire I, I would consider that the totality of undeveloped zinc projects globally, particularly, you know, those held by a junior as in not already locked up by a major, um, and when you think about not just our past resource, in fact, you have to think well past our, our, our 2018 resource and the tremendous exploration success we've had since then. And, you know, contemplate, is, is there another project like ours that is potentially up for grabs? When the corporate development teams, uh, you know, in, in all the big zinc miners get that mandate and, and they will get the mandate and they always get the mandate at the top of the market, right? Because there's the need to, to acquire these things. When they get that mandate to, to buy a big splashy zinc asset, who else is going to be ahead of us on the list? And if we're not number one on the list, you got to consider that we're we're very high, right? And so these these best in class projects, when they transact, um, transact for a lot of money, and 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 the move can be very quick near the end, as as John pointed out. You know, a a very rapid move, you know, from thirty eight cents to nine bucks. Uh, Arizona mining from twenty cents to six and a half bucks in two and a bit years. A uh, great bear, you know, to to thirty bucks from. 20 cents in, in three and a half years or something like that, right? And yeah. Great Bear and exploration success, but Arizona Mining, for example, there was a lot understood there and it still took off like that, right? So great projects, in particular great, great base metal projects, go unloved right up until the point they are loved to death and and, and that is a glorious, you know, phoenix flaming death and, of money, right? So um, <laughs> cons, cons, like I said, con, consider you know, if, if you are have your hat on and you have to buy the best zinc project out there, uh, what what else are you looking at? So that that would be my my message. Fantastic answers across the board. Thank you. Um, thank you, first of all, to John and Carrie and George and Terry and Brandon for participating today. There was a lot of knowledge on this call. Um, for all you, all of you who were listening, um, all of these guys are very accessible. If you have further follow-up questions, I'm sure they would be happy to field them from you. And either Six can get you in touch with them or you can find them, I'm sure, through their own avenues. Um, and thank you so much to the audience. Of course, we wouldn't uh, we wouldn't be able to do these things if people weren't interested in listening. And uh, so thank you for spending some time with us today. And we hope you learned something. And we will uh, we'll see you again here soon at some point, uh, hopefully in better, better markets. Um, they have to be around the corner, right? Thanks, everyone. Take care. We'll see you again soon. Thanks, Gwen.